Um, well, I absolutely loved your new movie, Killer Joe. Thank Do you, you want to tell us a bit about how you got involved in it in the first place? Tracy Letts, the writer, who's one of the best dramatists in America, sent me the screenplay and said, hey, would you be interested in doing this? I had made a film of his, uh, one of his scripts called Bug, and uh, about five or six years ago, and I read this, thought it was brilliant, and I said, let me see if I can set it up with the right cast, and I think I did. And that's why I, did. I, I just love the material, the writing. So the cast was one thing I wanted to touch on, really, because they're not obvious people that would play the roles that they're in, I didn't think. But Some of them are. But they're inspired. Um, how did you come across, or how did you pick those, those characters? Mostly, you're given a cast by the movie God. They come together. I was going to cast three other young women. Uh, I never heard of Juno Temple. She sent me an audition video that she had done with her 10-year-old brother. It was unsolicited. I looked at it and she was immediately the character of Dottie in Killer Joe. And I had never seen any of her other films. But the audition was so great, I just signed her without having met her. Mm. McConaughey was a guy I knew was from that part of the country where the film is set. So he knew and understood these characters. In fact, he's moved back there. He's moved out of Hollywood and back to Texas to raise his family. So he had the right accent and attitude and high intelligence. And that's the thing that counts the most with me is intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, well, Matthew's role, he plays a bit of a psycho, but we, that sort of comes across throughout the, the period of the film. Do you think that he was like the right person? To, how, do you, how did you direct him in that from being, because he does the rom-coms, but he's done an awful lot of other things as well. How did you transition him into this role? Well, the romantic comedies he's done is because of the way he looks. That If you look as he does and you become an actor in Hollywood, that's all they want you to do again and again and again. But that isn't him. Um, all that he and I did was discuss the nature of Killer Joe. And he understood the nature of that character, as did I. So we were immediately on the same page. And then what a director does, really, I'm going to let you all in on a little secret. What a director mostly does, aside from picking the material and finding the cast, is you provide an atmosphere for the actors and the crew to do their best work. You, you, you try to give them a kind of freedom to create and, and to know that you're not going to be judging them. As a director, I'm not judgmental. Once I've cast the film properly, I just want to make the actors free enough to give the best they can. And that's how I directed him. Well, the, the movie, you mentioned the atmosphere, that there's quite a few difficult scenes to watch in the film. What was it like on set for you, and how did you sort of cope with that? How did you make them feel at ease directing them in that? My time? sets are always fun and filled with humor and practical jokes, you know, and good old boy humor, uh, even if it's, there are a lot of women involved, the good old girl humor. I don't run a, a tough set. And I try to take things easy in my life. I try not to get too upset about things. Because if you pick up the newspaper every morning, you're going to be upset for the rest of the day. Because the world is all fucked up today. And in my view, uh, you can't live with that. You have to live outside of that. There's very little we can do, frankly, about you know, what's happening in our lives. If it was up to you, uh, Europe and the rest of the world, with the exception of China, wouldn't be broke, would we? You know, if it was up to me, America would not be $17 trillion in debt, the legacy we're leaving to our children, to China. You know, so I don't take, you can't take things too seriously, you know, you, or you would be so upset that you couldn't get on with it. Um, you've been in this industry for an awful long time now. How have you seen it change from you know your early movies to, to movies up in 2012 and beyond? Uh, it's a different zeitgeist. It's a different um, attitude out there. Films were not primarily for teenagers when I started making them in the late 60s and early and through the 70s. Films were largely made in America were largely for adults. And you had films like The Godfather and Taxi Driver 
and uh, Five Easy Pieces and Chinatown and uh, many, many very important, great films about genuine human beings and emotion. And today, the films that are popular that are made in America are largely comic books and video games. And they're uh, so-called pure entertainment. In Hollywood, when I was fortunate enough to come up, they wanted to entertain people, but they also wanted to challenge them and enlighten them. And at the major Hollywood studios, that's not what you have anymore. Um, and I'm not sure, because of the state of the world, that people don't want just sheer entertainment and escapism. They, that's not what we wanted in the 70s. The 70s were a confrontational time in America. That's how filmmakers like myself and others were able to make films. It was the Vietnam War period where we saw our government was nuts, was sending our young people off to a meat grinder to get chopped up for no reason. The reason given, some of the generals were saying, we have to destroy Vietnam in order to save it. Now, if that isn't absurd, what is? And so, some of my films today are a reaction to that very same attitude which exists today in my country. We have to destroy Iraq in order to save it. Something I don't understand, but, you know, it, it, it certainly grabs my attention. Mm. Um, I've got to wrap up, but finally, what, what do you think if there was a TV series for The Exorcist? Because apparently there's talk of there going to be one. No, there isn't. The guys happen. who put that out don't have the rights to do it. I think it would be a load of bollocks that would be too much to take. Okay. I, I think it would be completely unbelievable. You know, very little is understood about exorcism. And in the 20th century, the Catholic Church in the United... I'm not a Catholic, by the way, but the Catholic Church in the United States had three cases of what they considered demonic possession and exorcism in the entire 20th century of America. So if some bloke wants to put them on television one a week or something, they'd be laughed off the air. Most of these sequels that they've made of the X, all of them are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What I've seen of them, you know, they, they want to make me vomit as, as the little girl vomits in the movie. And I find them vomit instilling, starting with Exorcist 2, going on to 3, 4, 5, wherever they are now. I haven't seen them. But to have to put up with this crap on television every week would be too much to bear. Well, I'm glad it, to hear that because uh, yours is by far the best. And, uh, and by far the best. best. The others don't even exist <laughs> in any kind of parallel universe. The other films made uh, as so-called sequels to The Exorcist were just giant rip-offs, you know, uh, you know uh, designed to put people in chairs and relieve them of their hard-earned cash. Mm. Um, okay, we have to finish. Thank you so much for the film. It's my really pleasure.